comes in the second year of the decade of action for delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals, a time when concerted action to implement 2030 agenda in a gender-responsive manner needs to be accelerated to achieve full gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls by 2030. This is also, there is also a rich program to be held at side events and parallel events organized on virtual platforms by member states, UN entities, and civil society organizations. In addition, many stakeholders are using the occasion to bring CSW home and organize local events at national, subnational, and regional levels. Dear friends, last year we marked the 25th anniversary of the adoption of Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. In the political declaration adopted at CSW 64 during, and during high-level meeting of General Assembly, member states committed to the full, effective, and accelerated implementation of Beijing Platform for Action. They identified the need for strengthening our collective efforts towards achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls, including full enjoyment of their human rights. The time to honor that commitment is now. Women remain significantly underrepresented in all aspects of decision-making. The feminization of poverty and women's limited access to finance and greater share of care duties limit their full participation in public life. The Platform for Action commits states to take actions to ensure women's equal access to and full implementation and full participation in all spheres of public life and highlights gender balance in decision making as critical for achieving gender equality. In many countries, including in my own country, Armenia, the potential of women's equal and meaningful participation in public life is yet to be fully realized. We need to recommit ourselves to creating a conducive environment for empowerment of women in decision-making processes, including in political leadership. We must work to ensure that women, national gender equality mechanisms, and women organizations are included in planning, decision-making, and implementation of pandemic response and recovery measures, and that such measures are gender responsive. The Platform for Action also recognizes violence against women as a critical area of concern and a key obstacle to the achievement of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Available studies and data indicate that violence against women in political and public life is globally pervasive and may be increasing as more women seek access to power. Urgent action is needed to prevent, eliminate, and respond to violence against women in public life. Dear colleagues, Consolidated support of the international community is crucial for ensuring that women and girls are protected in conflict settings and in situations of humanitarian crisis, as they are the ones disproportionately affected and continue to be at risk of injustice and inequality, including in terms of access to essential services, resilience, and livelihood opportunities. Adding to the existing challenges and structural barriers, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought a profound shock to societies and economies. Its gender-specific dimensions are visible across every area of life, not least because of the shadow pandemic of gender-based and domestic violence. As the leading intergovernmental body on gender equality and the empowerment of women, the Commission has an enormous responsibility in making sure that no, women, no woman or girl will be left behind at this critical moment in time. CSW 65 provides an opportunity to come, to come up with strong action-oriented policy recommendations and ensure that we build back better towards a future that is more equal, resilient, and sustainable. This can only be achieved if all stakeholders are united in taking the bold steps required to make gender equality a reality by 2030. I count on the support of all of you to make this session memorable, ambitious, and transformative for all women and girls. Let us all work together for a meaningful outcome that will make a tangible difference for world's women and girls now and for the generations to come. I thank you. I now invite the Secretary General of the United Nations to address the Commission.
Please, Mr. Secretary General. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to address the Commission on the Status of Women. We meet for a second time in the context of the pandemic, which is having a devastating impact on women and girls. COVID-19 is a crisis with a woman's face. The fallout has shown how deeply gender inequality remains embedded in the world's political, social, and economic systems. Those disparities have themselves exacerbated the damage, and we have all paid the price. Women make up 70% of the world's healthcare workforce and occupy most of the jobs in the economic sectors that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. Compared to men, women are 24% more likely to lose their jobs and can expect their income to fall 50% more steeply. Women's and girls' unpaid work has risen dramatically owing to stay-at-home orders, the closure of schools and childcare facilities, increased elder care, and so much else. The pandemic has also sparked a shadow epidemic of violence against women worldwide, both online and offline. Every month, the toll rises, from sexual abuse to child marriage. The damage is incalculable and will resound down the decades into future generations. Now is the time to change course. Women's equal participation is the game changer we need. Decades of evidence show that women's participation enhances economic results, prompts greater investment in social protection, leads to more sustainable peace and advances climate action. Now it is the COVID-19 response that has spotlighted the great power of women's leadership. Over the past year, women leaders are among those who have kept transmission rates low and put countries on track for recovery. Women's organizations have filled crucial gaps in the provision of services and information, especially at the community level. Greater gender balance has led to better responses. Conversely, Countries with less effective responses have tended to be those where strong men approaches prevail and women's rights are under assault. The Organisation des Nations Unies a quant à elle placé les femmes au centre de son action de lutte contre le Covid-19 et de la relance. Nous avons été parmi les premiers à publier une évaluation de l'impact de la pandémie sur les femmes. Nous avons demandé que des mesures de relance soient prises pour appuyer l'économie informée dans l'économie des soins et cibler les entrepreneuses. Et nous avons collaboré avec les pouvoirs publics et les populations pour faire face à la recrudescence des violences faites aux femmes, notamment en veillant à ce que les centres d'hébergement restent ouverts et en organisant le transfert des services existants en ligne. Mon appel à un cessez-le-feu mondial a été immédiatement suivi d'un appel à la fin de la violence dans les foyers. Au-delà, nous avons à chaque occasion souligné l'efficacité d'une participation des femmes sur un pied d'égalité. Pourtant, si l'on regarde la situation dans le monde, on constate que les femmes restent largement exclues de l'exercice des plus hautes responsabilités. Les femmes ne comptent que pour un quart des parlementaires, un tiers des élus locaux et un cinquième des ministres de la planète. Seulement 22 pays sont dirigés par une femme. Et au rythme actuel, la parité au niveau des chefs de gouvernement ne sera pas attente avant 2150. Vous avez bien entendu, encore 130 années dominées par des hommes qui prendront les mêmes décisions, le même genre de décisions qu'ils ont prises depuis les 130 dernières années, je dirais depuis toujours. La pandémie a offert aux hommes une occasion de plus de s'accaparer de la prise des décisions. D'après une étude portant sur 87 pays, 
85% des groupes de travail sur le COVID-19 COVID were largely comprised of men. If we consider global media coverage uh, focused on the pandemic, experts Uh, female experts are consulted uh, one out of every five times that male experts are ex ex are consulted. There's a need to address this imbalance when women do not participate in decision making. We only see the world through one angle. We create economic models that do not assess and measure the productive work that takes place at home. We create a digital fora with masculine bias, which is incorporated into their very code. And we see decisions taken that threatened efforts undertaken to ensure equitable access to health and reproductive services. And we expend billions of dollars on weapons that do not protect people better while neglecting violence endured by one out of every three women worldwide. There's a need to shuffle, reshuffle the deck to shift this situation. For this reason, one of my top priorities as Secretary General was to increase the number of women in senior positions and at my senior management group, as well as among resident coordinators and uh, special envoys. Last year, we achieved the gender parity among the senior representatives and this was two years ahead of schedule and we are now making headway at all levels we are also striving to ensure women's full participation in the uh, peacekeeping process in mediation and in peace building however there is tremendous work that lies ahead in peace negotiations between 1992 and 2019 only 13% of negotiators, 6% of mediators, and 6% of uh, the signatories of peace accords were women. Still, today, these negotiations are structured in such a way as uh, to applaud and even encourage individuals who fuel violence rather than those individuals who build peace. Excellencies, too often When addressing the challenge of exclusion, it is suggested that we focus on training, capacity building, empowerment for women. But women already have the skills, the expertise, and the capacity. In many countries, they are graduating from higher education at higher rates than men, and they have been for some time. What you need is not more training for women, but to train those in power on how to build inclusive institutions. We need to move beyond fixing women and instead fix our systems. We must also support women leaders in all their diversity and abilities, including young women, migrant women, indigenous women, women with disabilities, women of color, and LGBTIQ+. Pandemic recovery is our chance to engineer a reset, reignite the decade of action for the Sustainable Development Goals, and chart a path to an equal future for women and men. I call on all leaders to put in place five key building blocks. First, realize women's equal rights fully, including by repealing discriminatory laws and enacting positive measures. Second, ensure equal representation from company boards to parliaments, from higher education to public institutions, through special measures, including quotas. Third, to advance women's economic inclusion through equal pay, targeted credit, job protection, and significant investments in the care economy and social protection. Fourth, to enact an emergency response plan in each country to address violence against women and girls and follow through with funding, policies, and political will. And fifth, to give space to the intergenerational transition that is underway. From the front lines to online, young women are advocating for a more just and equal world and merit greater support. This year, we have an opportunity to advance this agenda through the Generation Equality Forum and action coalitions being convened by the UN Women, co-hosted by the governments of Mexico and France in partnership with civil society and youth. Excellencies, gender equality is essentially a question of power. We still live in a male-dominated world with a male-dominated culture.
and this must change. And males are an essential part of the solution. This Commission will continue to play a central role in shifting mindsets, calling out systemic bias and mobilizing tangible, meaningful action. Earlier this year, we lost an inspiring leader of this shared cause, Margaret Snyder, the founding director of UNIFEM and an ally of women's groups across the world. Last year, reflecting on the early years of her efforts and the obstacles she faced, she wrote, and I quote, through all of the administrative issues, we were reminded that working to empower the poorest women was threatening to some high level and powerful people. They could move us, but they couldn't stop us. End of quote. Together, you are an unstoppable force. Together, we have a chance to leave behind entrenched exclusion and build a just and equal future. Let's make it happen together, and I thank you. I thank, I thank the Secretary General for the statement and I want to acknowledge his personal contribution and stewardship in advancing women's representation and their leadership across the entire United Nations system. I now invite the President of the Economic and Social Council, His Excellency Munir Akram, to address the Commission. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary General, at the outset, I would like to congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, on leading the Commission on the Status of Women at its 65th session and wish you and your Bureau all success in your deliberations. The theme of this session Women's effective participation in decision-making in public life and elimination of all forms of violence against them is linked intrinsically <clears throat> with their empowerment in the social, political, economic, cultural, and legal spheres. Despite considerable progress since the Beijing Conference, women's voices often continue to be silenced and their participation in public life obstructed. Meanwhile, discrimination and violence against women remains pervasive. The serious and persistent obstacles which impede women's empowerment include armed conflicts, foreign occupation, terrorism, natural disasters, pandemics, climate change, the feminization of poverty, discrimination and violence, and the lack of equal access to health, education, training, and employment. Mr. Chairman, both developed and developing countries face these challenges in promoting gender equality. Neither sustainable development nor a peaceful and just world order can be achieved so long as women continue to be repressed and marginalized. Concrete measures must be taken by member states and the international community to achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls as outlined in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and in the agreed conclusions adopted by the Commission on the Status of Women as well as in particular SDG Target 5.5, prescribing women's equal leadership at all levels of decision making. Mr. Chairman, we must commend the Secretary General for his sincere efforts to promote gender parity within the United Nations system and throughout the world. Parity, as he has just noted, has already been achieved in, at the senior management level at the United Nations and is within sight at the professional level. 
It is equally essential for member states to ensure effective and accelerated implementation of the Beijing Declaration and Platform of Action and the fulfillment of the obligations under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, as well as the commitments made in different United Nations conventions, conferences, and summits, which are mutually reinforcing. To ensure women's meaningful participation and eliminate violence against them, the international community, I believe, needs a new global compact for women's empowerment based on an action plan for mainstreaming women's participation in decision-making in public life and proposing concrete measures to eliminate all forms of violence against them, against women and girls. The agreed conclusions of the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women could provide a concrete recommendations for framing such a global compact. We hope that the international community, Mr. Chairman, will rise to the challenge and ensure that half of the world's population is never again left behind. I thank you. I thank the President of the Economic and Social Council for his statement. And I now invite the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Volkan Boskir, to address the Commission. Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, representatives of the civil society. I commend the Bureau, all delegations, as well as civil society representatives and UN women for their tireless work throughout negotiations over the past few weeks. Your work builds upon the commitments made at the high-level meeting on the 25th anniversary of the Fourth World Conference of Women, where 160 member states shared their plans to accelerate the realization of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Since this meeting, I have established an advisory group on gender equality and consulted with the group of friends on gender parity, including the more than 50 women who serve here as permanent representative to the United Nations. In order to mainstream gender equality throughout the work of the General Assembly, I also intend to engage with civil society on this issue in the coming weeks. My work so far has led me to one concrete conclusion. We can only truly achieve gender equality if we assure the, ensure the full and effective participation of women in decision making. Today, only one in four parliamentarians are women. It is clear that underrepresentation in decision making processes has led to the specific needs of women being overlooked. However, we must ask ourselves. How can we expect laws to empower women and girls when women lawmakers themselves are subjected to online psychological, physical, and sexual violence? Attempts to discourage women from exercising their right to vote and to seek election are pervasive and have profound intergenerational consequences. Over the years, the General Assembly has adopted many resolutions on this issue, including the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the Convention on the Political Rights of Women, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Resolutions 58-142, 66-130, 73-148. 
The membership also has considered several reports presented by the Secretary General and the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. Yet, we have not found a solution. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, if we are to create change, we need to move beyond, beyond rhetoric. Part of the problem is that the majority of incidents go unreported due to stigma and outdated patriarchal norms which are often perpetuated by the media. I call here on all member states to strengthen legislation against gender-based violence, establish reporting and redress mechanisms for victims, commit to data collection, election observation, and violence monitoring, and consider special and well-designed gender targets. Furthermore, I ask all permanent representatives here today to join me in becoming an international gender champion, which the pin I carry with honor and pride. I ask journalists to end gender-based stereotyping and gendered media coverage of women in politics and public life. For no woman should feel the need to justify her presence or make herself smaller so that others are comfortable, or fear expressing herself, exercising her right to vote, or seeking election to public office. No woman should be under threat, underpaid, or underestimated. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, representatives of the civil society, Make no mistake, we will not achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development without guaranteeing women's full and effective participation and decision-making in public life, as well as the elimination of violence everywhere. Here in this room, we have the power to create a better world for all. The General Assembly itself represents what many thought to be impossible 75 years ago. Today, I urge you to be bold, to make possible what some may deem impossible, to emulate the resilience of women around the world in whose name we work. Together, we can become generation equality. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to address to you today, and I wish you all the best in your endeavors in your very important meeting throughout the days ahead. Thank you very much. Excellencies, dear friends, I now invite the Commission to hear a statement by a representative of civil society, Ms. Virisila Buadromo, of the Urgent Action Fund for Women's Human Rights Asia and Pacific. And that will be pre-recorded video. Please play the video. Thank you for the opportunity to help set the tone for the opening of the 65th session on the Commission on the Status of Women. I'm Virisila Mbondromo, co-lead of a feminist fund that supports women and non-binary human rights defenders and activists in moments of crisis. We're called the Urgent Action Fund Asia and the Pacific. If you notice my emphasis on the word and between Asia and the Pacific, it's deliberate. It's for our small island states scattered over the world's largest mass of water and is often the silent, unrecognized partner in the Asia-Pacific coinage. The and, therefore, is to recognize the diversity of our origins, cultures, and religions, and is to ensure that we're not overshadowed by the geographically bigger and economically powerful Asian partners. Most importantly, it ensures that every Pacific woman, girl, and non-binary person is heard. The Pacific region has some of the highest rates of violence against women globally high formal unemployment, high poverty rates, and entrenched patriarchal social structures have resulted in Pacific men outnumbering Pacific women in paid employment by the rates of two to one. Women's representation in parliament and decision-making is a meager 7.7%, and the Pacific region includes three of the four countries globally without women MPs. 
A Fiji-based sex worker collective we recently supported shared that while the initial emergency funding requirements were to mitigate against the threat of police brutality and harassment, over time their concerns had converged with the climate emergency risks of the wider Pacific. For you see, like most Pacific islands, Fiji gets battered annually by frequent cyclones. This throws the life of people already living on the margins into absolute disarray, further pushing them into poverty. The sex workers we supported were forced to mobilize around the climate emergency. It was this need to survive the odds that they were faced with that forced them to realize that their work is interlinked with a bigger climate struggle and that they cannot afford not to participate. In our region, Pacific Islanders, especially women, trans communities and girls, have to battle with the existential crisis that directly impacts their participation in the broader and bigger talks around equity and equality. In Fiji and most Pacific Island countries, women and girls are often the first at risk when a climate-related event hits a community. The loss of resources aside, issues like losing access to educational opportunities and safe spaces impacts women and children for a far longer period, more than the time it often takes for a community to recover. Women's choices are impacted in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. As a feminist once said to me, when you're deciding where you're going to go for safety, how do you know you'll be safe in an emergency center? In Fiji and in most Pacific Island countries, women charged with running the household are often the first respondents when a tropical cyclone hits, sharing information and resources within their communities. Women are just getting on with it because their survival is at risk. The tragedy is that these local hard-working wise women have the knowledge and skills to combat the climate crisis, but they're absent from the decision-making tables. And those that do get the opportunity to speak are the voices that have spoken before or have more access and privilege. I humbly acknowledge that my privilege as the funder has brought me to this podium. Right, uh, let's uh, come out of that uh, 65th session of the UN uh, Commission on the status of women. We'll, we'll certainly come back uh, to it, but we need to get to, to Chris.